Welcome to today's Cancer Biomedicine BSc Taster Session. Thanks very much for joining us. My name is Yanni Leung. I'm a current Cancer Biomedicine student here at UCL and your chair this afternoon. We're hoping this Taster Session will address those core specific questions you may have and will help you to gain an insight into what it really is like to study on our Cancer Biomedicine undergraduate program. So this afternoon, our speaker, Dr. Ursula McGovern will introduce you to some of the great science and medicine that you will learn as a student of the Cancer Biomedicine BSc here at UCL. Dr. McGovern will also provide a summary of the Cancer Biomedicine program, and there will be a Q&A session for the second part of the event. This session is being recorded and will be made available on our website following today's event. We're here to respond to your questions, so please share those throughout using the Q&A function on Zoom. Now to introduce our speaker, we have Dr. Ursula McGovern. Dr. Er Dr. McGovern is a consultant medical oncologist at University College London Hospitals. She was appointed a consultant in 2011 and completed her oncology training in London, obtaining a PhD in molecular oncology from Imperial College. She specializes in the treatment of prostate and bladder cancer in her role as a UCL Honorary Associate Professor. She runs the oncology teaching program delivered by UCL Medical School and is the undergraduate program lead for the UCL Cancer Institute. Helping to train and encourage UCL students to become the cancer physicians and researchers of the future. Over to you, Dr. McGovern. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Yanni, um, and welcome, everyone. It's lovely to see so many of you on the um, call today. So um, as Yanni's introduced me, so just to, to, to explain my role, really, I, I do wear two hats. I'm, I'm a working oncologist at UCLH, um, but I'm very much involved in the teaching that's delivered, or the cancer teaching that's delivered by UCL. So um, cancer biomedicine is one of our programmes. Um, and today's session is really to give you a little bit of a taster about cancer as a topic and then to talk a little bit about our degree programme as well. So we know that cancer is an old common disease. It's been around really for, for thousands of years. And if you look back in history, there's mention of it in Egyptian papyri. Um, but, you know, given it's such an old disease, it's really probably in only the last hundred years or so that we've actually had treatment for cancer. So it's been a, been a bit of a conundrum for scientists for a long time thinking about what might cause cancer, why does it happen, how does it develop, um, and how do we develop treatments for it. So an old disease, and um, really only treatment for it over the last hundred years or so. And probably a lot of you know this already, but if we think about, well, what is cancer? So basically, this is where cells start to, to um, divide uncontrollably. So they lose the normal things that keep them in, in shape. Um, and cancer cells will grow abnormally, they'll spread, they'll spread into other organs. Um, and we see cancers from all different sites in the body. So we know about the common cancers that we see, things like bone cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer. Um, but there are over 200 different types of cancer. So this is this is a big problem for us um, in the NHS in England and globally. It's a very common condition. So just a little question. Um, you know, it'd be good if you could just pop your answers in the chat. Just to think about this, true or false? Now, one in two people in the UK are going to be diagnosed with cancer. What do people think? Just pop in the chat whether you think that's true or false so we can just have a feel of what people think. It's completely anonymous, so if you think it's false, put it in. If you think it's true, put it in. Um, so we're getting a big mix here. So some true, some false. So clearly it's it's, uh, oh, it's probably 50-50, actually. So that's interesting. So a bit of a scary figure, that, isn't it? And actually, that is true. So we are seeing you now that one in two people are going to develop cancer in their lifetime in the UK, which is a bit of a scary statistic. Um, but I think what's really, really important to remember here is, yes, we are dealing with something that's very common. And I think probably lots of people on this call will know people who've had a diagnosis of cancer. But we need to remember, you know, patients are surviving a cancer diagnosis. So this is not saying one in two of us are going to die from a cancer diagnosis. Lots and lots of patients nowadays 
are cured of their disease. So if you're diagnosed with early stage breast cancer, you're very likely to be cured. So it's a common condition, but our treatments are getting much better and survival rates are improving as well. And that probably is at the core of this course. You know, how do we improve outcomes for cancer patients um, and improve their, their long-term survival? So thinking about cancer, and again, I'm thinking, you know, very much thinking of the patterns we see here in the UK. And um, why are we seeing more cancer cases? Because it is a very prevalent and common condition, and probably the biggest driver for cancer is age. So the older you are, the more likely you are to develop a uh, cancer diagnosis. And we know in many countries now we are seeing an aging population. People are living longer, so they are more likely to develop cancer and get a cancer diagnosis. But I would put that in the context of survival as well. So although we're seeing more cases of cancer, we're seeing more and more cases of patients surviving a cancer diagnosis. So our outcomes are getting much better. And certainly over probably the last 30 years, things have really, really improved in our treatments. And, and as I say, you know, it is still a disease generally of older people, but we all know that younger people can get it. I mean, any of you who watch the news at the moment, we're hearing a lot about Sir Chris Hoy, only in his 40s, been diagnosed with advanced uh, prostate cancer. We have the, the Duchess of Cambridge with a very, um, she's had a, a young diagnosis as well. So it is common in younger patients as well, but really we're seeing it much more in younger patients. So if you look here, um, you know, we're seeing patients in their 80s getting a cancer diagnosis. And we think of the common cancers often now we talk about breast cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer and bowel cancer. So they are the things that are keeping us very busy with all these patients coming through with their diagnosis. So just a little bit to sort of set the scene with cancer, because there's an awful lot going on with cancer treatment at the moment. And we've got lots of different treatment options for our patients. So we can think about surgery. We can think about chemotherapy. We can think about immunotherapy, radiotherapy, lots and lots of different treatments. And what's really good for our patients nowadays is that actually there can be combinations of treatments. So some patients may have surgery and chemotherapy and radiotherapy, um, and that's probably also helping to improve outcomes. And we've got newer treatments coming through and we're starting to think of cancer at much more of a personalised level where we can potentially target treatment for patients. And again, this is really pertinent to this degree programme, Cancer Biomedicine, because we're looking at cancer at a molecular genetic level and what's happening, what pathways are going wrong, what can we do to try and target that and treat it. So these are the sort of things you're going to learn about if this is a degree that you um, undertake. So a little bit about our treatment <laughs> options for cancer. So chemotherapy, everyone sort of thinks about chemo, oh, it makes your hair fall out, makes people feel sick. And um, actually that's not true with all patients. And um, there are lots of different side effects that can happen with chemotherapy. But if we think about scientifically, what is happening with chemotherapy? So we know cancer cells grow quickly. So we need something that's going to target rapidly growing cells. And chemotherapy is very good at that. So we think about at the cellular level, it's trying to damage the DNA of cancer cells beyond repair, stopping the cells going through the normal cell cycle, preventing them dividing, and um, it's a very effective treatment for, for any rapidly dividing cells. So chemotherapy, we still use an awful lot of chemotherapy to treat the cancer patients, and it can be a very effective treatment. And just to think about, you know, chemotherapy and how it works, and we often give combinations of chemotherapy to our patients um, because there are different ways that chemotherapy can have an effect. So we have multiple different mechanisms of action and you're really trying to hit that cancer cell as hard as possible. And if you use different drugs that work in different ways, you can get multiple hits and you, you can get sort of an additive effect. So some of our chemotherapy drugs mitosis, some will interfere with DNA replication or transcription. Um, so we often give combination drugs. And although that might increase the side effects of chemotherapy, it also makes it more effective because you're really targeting that cancer cell and trying to destroy it um, and prevent any further development of that tumour. Now, chemotherapy, I said, does have side effects. And these are the sort of list of, of side effects. I would go through more with my patients. I talked to you about the fact that we're trying to target rapidly growing cells, so that's cancer cells. But the problem is we have a lot of normal cells that grow quite quickly as well. So 
when we're talking to a patient about chemotherapy, this would be the typical sort of list that we go through. Um, you might feel a bit tired. You may have some nausea and vomiting. Younger patients, so I said often cancer is often a disease of older patients, but clearly we said we see young patients. So infertility can be a problem with um, chemotherapy in younger patients. Illness doesn't happen with all chemotherapy drugs. does happen with some. Um, and can be quite a distressing side effect for some of our patients. Probably the most important side effect as, as a doctor is the risk of bone damage to the brain. Because as I said, we're targeting rapid growth therapy. So we target often inadvertently the bone marrow. So your white blood cells, your red cells, um, and patients are more at risk of infection. So we always counsel our patients um, about the risk of infections and fever and they've had chemotherapy. The bowel, the GI tract, rapidly dividing cells, so it's not unusual to get things like mouth ulcers and diarrhea with chemotherapy. And we can also see um, nerve damage as well, so some of our chemotherapy drugs can affect the nerves. So, so we really need to always explain to our patients, you know, the rationale behind treatment, the probable side effects and what they can expect, but chemotherapy is very, very effective treatment. Radiotherapy, another very good treatment for um, cancer, and again, something that you would learn a lot about on our course. And we're one of the only centres or two centres in the UK that has a proton beam therapy um, treatment centre on site. So radiotherapy, very effective cancer treatment. Again, it's about targeting those cells and trying to destroy the DNA of these cancer cells so that you prevent them from replicating and spreading. And radiotherapy is slightly different to chemo because it's targeted treatment. So you're aiming your radiotherapy beams at the tumour. So you deliver as much dose as you can um, to the cancer while you try and protect the surrounding tissues. So it can still be very curative treatment for things like prostate cancer, lung cancer, um, et cetera. Very effective treatment. And this is just a nice example of a patient Having radiotherapy, so they'll um, lie on the on the the couch. The the linear accelerator, which is the machine that delivers the the radiotherapy, will you get lined up and and you have your dose delivered to the specific tumor type. So very effective treatment and, and curative treatment. And again, patients can go on and live and have a normal life expectancy after having radical curative radiotherapy. Some of you may have heard about immunotherapy, and there's no doubt this is the future for certainly some cancers. And again, you're going to learn a lot about this in our cancer biomedicine course, because immunotherapy really is groundbreaking in terms of what we're seeing with cancer. So we know that cancer cells are very clever. They can sit under the radar of the immune system, um, and the immune system is essentially switched off in cancer patients. And what we're doing with immunotherapy is trying to manipulate that, and we want to turn the immune system back on and see if it can fight the cancer. Um, and this has really revolutionized the treatment for some of our cancers. So immunotherapy now very commonly used, potentially in conjunction with chemotherapy and radiotherapy as well. So it's a really good future um, treatment for, for patients and, and has really evolved over probably the last five or 10 years. Um, this is it probably looks a bit of a complicated diagram, but I like this because it's I've got a nice quote here to tell us what immunotherapy is doing. So if you see here, releasing the brakes in a car, allowing it to get on the move again. So that's often what we'd say to patients. You know, we're trying to you know switch back on the immune system, get it working again. So it's going to recognize these tumor cells and then can destroy them. So it works completely differently to how chemotherapy and radiotherapy work. Um, and has really revolutionized treatment. And well, a nice example here where you can see, um, basically this is a melanoma, so malignant melanoma, very difficult cancer to treat with things like chemotherapy. Look at it, it's completely melted away with immunotherapy. So really revolutionized treatment for what was a very difficult cancer to treat. So, so we're using immunotherapy now, melanoma, renal cell cancers, lung cancer commonly, um, and it's completely changed the landscape of what we do. So, so the role of the immune system is something you'll learn a lot about in our degree program. And the role of the immune system in treating cancer, very, very important and something that um, a lot of our students will be doing sort of research projects on. So it's a really developing field. And many people have heard of CAR T cell therapy. Again, you know, this is a, a real sort of novel treatment that's looking very promising. So again, this is manipulating the immune system to try and treat cancers. And this has shown a lot of promise in, in hematological malignancies. I think that leukemias, and particularly in paediatrics, so children's cancers, 
this is something that's been, um, you know, really, really groundbreaking. And again, using the knowledge that we learn as scientists and adapting that to what we can do in clinical practice. Um, and I'll put a little um, shout out for, for this programme that you might want to watch if you're interested. So, so you may find hopefully on the iPlayer. So, Warm in the Blood, A Cure for Cancer. Um, this was talking about CAR T cell therapy. And, and this was, you know, patients who were treated at UCLH with scientific research that was done at UCL within the Cancer Institute. So, you know, when I talk about as being real groundbreakers in treatment, you know, the evidence is there. This is work that our scientists are doing, which then translates into clinical practice and is really making a difference for our patients. Um, and, you know, again, this is something from um, a news story a few years ago, you know, complete game changer. Um, looking at CAR T cell therapy and treatment for cancers. And so, you know, we talk about our future researchers as, you know, really making a difference to patients and, and that translation from bed to bed, uh, bench to bedside in terms of making a difference. So, so the CAR T cell work is a great example of some of the fantastic scientific work at the Cancer Institute that is now becoming part of normal clinical practice. Um, just also to mention targeted treatments, because again, this is something that you'll learn a lot about on our course, and it's definitely another thing that we're moving into within oncology, um, because we're looking much more at what's happening at the cellular level. So you'll find on our course, um, you know, the first year is very much about learning about um, physiology, biochemistry, anatomy, the, the basics of health and disease, because to understand what's going wrong in cancer, you first need to understand what the normal processes are. Um, and by understanding, you know, how cells grow, how they divide, how hormones work, um, you get a really good understanding of potentially how you can develop targeted treatments. So if we want to stop blood vessel formation in cancer cells, if we want to block the effect of hormones in cancer cells, um, you'll learn about that. And we, we are now translating that into clinical practice as well. So so many patients will be on what we call targeted treatments. Um, which are really specific to that sort of pathway to try and get therapeutic effects. So there's lots of different treatment options and lots of exciting developments going on um, within cancer. So another question for you, true or false? So 40% um, of cancers in the UK are preventable. So again, just pop in the chat, what do you think? 40% of cancers are preventable. Um, do we think that's true or do we think that's false? Oh, brilliant. Nearly everyone's saying true. Fantastic. So you you know exactly what's going on here. This is a true statement as well. And I think this is a pretty scary statement as well. So 40% of cancers could be preventable. So, you know, we're always trying to improve outcomes for patients, but actually what we probably want to do is stop patients developing cancer in the first place. And we need to think about all the things we can do to tackle that. Um, and again, I think probably a lot of you will know all these things. So we know, for example, smoking, not a good habit, really increases your risk of certain cancers. Um, there's pretty good evidence now coming through about things like obesity and poor diet. That's increasing risk. And the same thing is done, um, have vaccinations against particular viruses. And um, there's lots of different things we can do. And there's a really big push um, that we need to start educating people about their cancer risk because, you know, what we want to do is stop patients um, developing cancer in the first place. And again, just trying to think about, you know, what's been topical at the moment. You know, we are hearing a lot about younger people now getting cancers. Um, and we're not really sure why that's happening. Is there a genetic component? component? Is it environmental? Is it because of diet, protein, food, etc.? So all of these things are, you know, you could be researched at the moment. And something that we really need to tackle because we can have such a big impact on the numbers with cancer if we could just get people to follow healthy lifestyle choices. And you probably see a lot of this, so, you know, the in the UK, for example, a huge push to stop people smoking. We all know smoking is not good for us. It causes ischemic heart disease, it increases the risk of cancer. Um, and, you know, so a lot of these ad advertisements, for example, trying to put people off um, and they probably do work, actually. We've really managed to get our numbers down in the UK in terms of smoking. So we really need to educate people about the risks of what they do and their lifestyle choices and, and the risk of that in terms of developing cancer. So, again, thinking about, you know, patterns in the UK, 
Um, we often say as well, it does matter where you live. That's another thing that we see, that if you come from an area where there's greater social economic deprivation, um, your risk of cancer is going to be potentially higher as well. And again, you know, that's really important when you're thinking about, you know, how do we tackle these areas? So we've got deprived areas um, where perhaps we're seeing high rates of obesity, um, uh, population are not taking up screening options, perhaps they're not going to see their GP with red flag symptoms. There's a lot going on that we could really start to tackle. So we've said about lifestyle choices um, and we need to educate people so that we can you know, identify patients who are more, more at risk of developing cancer and intervene earlier. So there's a there's an awful lot we can do. It's not just about the science as well, it's about the socioeconomic impact. And in your first year of this course, we actually do a module called Cancer Medicine in Society. Uh, and we make our students think about this, you know, the bigger impact, you know, what's going on in populations, what's driving on the what's it like to get a cancer diagnosis, what are the socioeconomic costs of that? And um, you know, if you're working, if you've got a mortgage, all the things that you have to think about. Um, and we think about that in the course as well, you know, that the actual um, you know, impact on society of a cancer diagnosis. And, you know, this is really um, quite a staggering, you know, picture here. Look at the distribution of certain cancers in more deprived areas. So, so lung cancer in areas where there's greater socioeconomic deprivation, we're seeing higher rates of lung cancer often because we've got high proportion of patients who are smoking. Um, and then it really impacts on the care that we give. So um, as an oncologist, it's quite interesting, you know, the patterns of cancer that you might see in London are going to be very different from what you might see in Newcastle, which will in turn be very difficult from what you might see down in Devon. So there's a real picture here about what's going on um, in terms of distribution um, and the socio-economic impact um, that, that lifestyle and, and deprivation can have on cancer. And Another important aspect that we, we talk about, and this is much more relevant globally in terms of cancer. So infections um, probably globally account for about 20% of cancers. So it might not be the pattern we see in the UK, but we like to think about the global picture of cancers and what's happening in other continents and other countries. And certainly in other countries, um, infections will be a really big driver for cancer development. So we know that some viruses, for example, um, may have an effect on genes that will control, control cell growth. Um, and then this chronic inflammation caused by infections um, can eventually lead to cancer. So, so there's lots of work going on. And again, we've got a module to cover this um, when we think about um, infection and cancer risk. Um, and you learn about how different viruses may contribute to, to development of cancer. Um, and it's important to remember, you know, it's not a disease that you catch. Um, it's not passing person to person like an infection is. Um, so, again, it's about trying to think about some of those, the stigma sometimes that gets attached with a cancer diagnosis and trying to put to bed some of those um, so in, in, in the misconceptions about having a cancer diagnosis. So just to give you some examples, and again, I think this is really relevant on a much more global scale, but hepatitis, we know that increases the risk of primary liver cancer. And that's a big problem in the developing world. HIV, um, not everyone um, globally is on good antiretroviral therapy. So HIV increases your risk of things like lymphoma, cervical cancer. HPV, we now have a good vaccination program in some countries, but not everywhere. Um, and again, we're seeing um, HPV associated cancers, parasites, you know, all of these things can contribute. And, you know, this is a worldwide problem, particularly in the developing countries. So I've talked about patterns in the UK, but we're also very interested in teaching about what's happening on a global level as well with such a common condition. So just a little bit more now about the course. Um, so cancer biomedicine. So what's our aim with this course? So, you know, I've given you a sort of background to cancer as a topic, but what we want is to really educate and train the next generation of researchers and biomedical scientists. So, so how do we improve outcomes? How do we improve treatments? How do we stop resistance to treatment? It's through cancer research. And that, that's why we envisage um, our students sort of continuing in their, their career development. So we like to think, um, it's a very relevant degree. I've told you how common cancer is. Um, it's a real evolving field, lots of new treatments coming through. So it's quite a stimulating degree. Um, and we hope that we will equip you with the skills that you need to continue in research and to keep driving improvements forward um, and improving outcomes for our patients. So a little bit about the course. Um, and so 
Uh, you mentioned, you know, it's really important to have a, a grounding of the basics, first of all. So what happens in normal tissues? What are the normal pathways? How do cells normally develop? So year one of this course is shared with some of the other courses within the faculty. So things like applied medical sciences, sports science, nutrition, where you all learn together about the basic foundation in biology, anatomy, biochemistry, etc. Um, and so you start to look at, you know, what happens in healthy tissue, and what starts to happen with different 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 disease processes. And in that first year, um, we do our module cancer medicine in society. So, so um, we're literally just running that at the moment for, for one of our cohorts. And you know, that's an introduction to it, making you think about the bigger picture. Um, you know, what's it like to get cancer diagnosed? How do cancer patients deal with their diagnosis? What's the cost of cancer care? How do we decide how we fund drugs? It sort of um, gives you a nice sort of opening into to, to cancer um, in terms of its impact on society. And then year two and year three of our course are much more cancer focused. So we start to think about what's going wrong at the cellular level. So cancer biology and therapeutics. Um, you'll learn about how um, we uh, run clinical trials. How do we follow patients through their cancer journey? Um, we've talked about targeted treatment, individualized treatments, like precision medicine, thinking about things that we can target, pathways, um, you know, the, the molecular level of cancer and how we might think about treating patients, pathogens and cancer. So I talked about, you know, the risks of viruses and cancer development. So very important, that global issue. Radiation biology, that's a, a module we've introduced over the last couple of years. Um, you know, very important treatment for cancer. Um, and then we have optional modules as well. So we try to be flexible because we appreciate that, um, you know, students may have a particular interest in say, global health or pharmacology or whatever, and we usually try and accommodate those optional modules as well. And then in your third year, alongside your talk modules, that's when you get to do your research project. So, so Yanni is just in the process of starting to organise that now in her final year. Um, and so a lot of our students will be doing projects within the Cancer Institute with our um, investigators. Um, and, you know, we always try to find a cancer theme. It can be a lab-based project or a dry project. And then, you know, our students tend to get really involved with the labs um, and really enjoy that. So you really start to focus on something very specific and then you can do your dissertation as part of your third year. So our students, so, you know, generally we get good feedback about the course. I think our students like the fact that they're working and being taught with scientists and clinicians. Um, the research project in the final year, you know, big component of, of your degree, um, because often it starts to give you an idea about a particular field you might be interested in going into or give you some skills that you might want to take into postgraduate studies. Um, you know, we've got our, our students who um, are going on um, to do great things. So they're going on to master's projects, PhD projects, graduate medicine. So we're trying to make sure that we're giving you um, good future employability options. And, and I've mentioned the diversity of optional modules. And, and I often get asked this question because, you know, people say, well, oh, it's very specific for cancer. Doesn't that restrict me a little bit? And I don't think that's true at all because we said cancer is common, but a lot of the things you learn about cancer are um, you know, applicable to other disease processes as well. And because we um, are happy for students to do optional modules, you really do get a very good grounding in the medical sciences. So it's not just you come out and you know about cancer and nothing else. I think you really do get a really good understanding or things like molecular biology, genetics, and, and lots of other key topics as well. So just to talk about that, so I just put a list here of, you know, some of the other topics that we cover. So it's not just about um, cancer. So you can see here, um, you know, and this is depending on what your interest might be and what option you might want to so, um, you know, we'll have new modules coming through um, when the opportunities arise. So statistics for some very common um, skill to have if you want to understand clinical trials. So there's medical statistic modules, global health, bioinformatics programming, all these things that are becoming, you know, very important in terms of, of where we're going with cancer. So lots of different options that you can think about there. And just, you know, to start wrapping up from my perspective, career destinations, because this is another thing they often get asked. So, so it's great. A lot of our students, um, when they graduate, they want to stay in cancer research. So that's great for us because it means we've done a good job and we're keeping them going in the cancer field. So those students go on to do a master's and, and have PhDs. 
and um, you can go into the biomedical sciences if students want to go into the workforce. And um, each year we have students interested in graduate medicine, and this is a very good graduate medicine. Pharmaceutical industry, another good option um, because you'll have learned a lot about drug development and clinical trials um, and healthcare and other management. So, so there's a lot of potential good options um, for our students to, to think about. And, but it's great that a lot of our students are bringing within cancer. So hopefully that means we're doing a good job. We're keeping students engaged with the topic and they want to learn more and really apply their knowledge. So true or false, just probably to wrap up almost, the UCL Cancer Institute are some of the best cancer researchers in the world. So what do we think about that? I'm hoping that I've, I've given you a bit of evidence that, that that really is the case. And it's wonderful. I can see everyone putting true in the chat. That's a marvellous thing. So um, I, I am quite proud to say that. I think it's absolutely without doubt. We do have some amazing researchers at the UCL Cancer Institute. Um, and it is, it is well renowned, you know, so it's got really good reputation um, and it's a real international hub for cancer research. Um, and I love this picture here because I think it really sums up the, the close relationship between science um, and, and clinical practice. Because on the left is the uh, UCL Cancer Institute and directly opposite is the McMahon Cancer Centre where I do my clinic. And it literally we're across the road from each other. So it really, that hub has got bench to bedside. It really does work for the people uh, at the Cancer Institute that see patients in the Macmillan Cancer Centre and some of us who work in the Macmillan Cancer Centre that, that do work and teach in the Cancer Institute. So really, really close collaboration between science and medical profession. So um, just to summarise, so I think this is a really exciting field and the next 10 to 20 years, really, I think we're going to see some great work. So um, So that's what we want. We want you to think about this as a really good course. Um, and if you're really interested in cancer research, this is a really unique course and it really gives you an opportunity um, to, to really put forward cancer research in the future. So we would say, come in, make discoveries, help us stay the lives. Um, and really, it's over to you now. So I am going to come off my slides. Um, and at this point, um, we're very happy to take any questions from anyone. So we have a question for you, Dr. McGovern. So someone asked, what pathway did you have to go through in order to all in order to also become involved in the teaching process of the school? And do you find it difficult balancing both careers? Oh, good question. <laughs> so it's quite interesting because I think um, a lot of doctors teach because, you know, it, we really, you know, you have to... Um, Medical students, for example, they, they need to be taught by senior clinicians. So, so we, I think we're sort of programmed to like teaching anyway. But I think within oncology, and particularly medical oncologists, I'm a medical oncologist, the science is also very important because it's quite a scientific um, specialty. And so most of us um, as medical oncologists will also have done research and cancer research and PhDs. So you actually have, you know, a number of skills. You're used to teaching students. You've spent time working in the lab yourself doing cancer research. So you can, you know, deliver both of those hats really. So, um, and, you know, a lot of people, we just juggle it. You, you make it work really. I mean, we, we have lots of students that come into clinics. Um, I spend a lot of time in the Cancer Institute teaching um, and it works very well. So, so you'll find on the course, um, there's a lot of people who teach you who are either working scientists or working clinicians, and that's that's that it works really quite well. Yeah, uh, we have a lot of lectures from different professors that also work uh, while they're teaching. So I think it's actually great because we get to talk to them and actually learn about the, the impact because they're in the front front line of all this that is going on. So um, that's great. Okay, moving forward, there's another question. In year one, are there recommended resources to help prepare for topics like biology, anatomy, and biochemistry before the course begins? So um, for me personally, 
I haven't wor I didn't worry about that too early. So I was just going through my summer vacation. You know, I went through university applications, so I was just off having fun. So I didn't really prepare much before the course begins. And when I started my year one, I think like all the different modules, we actually get quite a lot of support. And we do have different tutorial sessions delivered by our lecturers and your tutors as well. So when you have questions, um, we will go through them in those sessions. And we will also go through like different case studies or scientific papers. So actually we do get a lot of research, a lot of resource when we start the program. And there's also like different reading materials that we go through before we go in lectures. So some modules, um, maybe in like anatomy or like biology, we do have the, uh, we do have like recordings that we have to listen before we go in for lectures. So I think doing those readings actually helped me a lot because I am prepared for what we're going to cover during the lecture. And I have a better understanding before I actually go in to the lecture. So I think you don't have to worry about that too much because you do get a lot of different resources when the course begins. Yeah, so that's that. Um, another question. In the case study, how are case studies integrate it into the curriculum and how frequently will we engage with them? So we actually do quite, do get quite a lot of case studies in the tutorial sessions, especially. So uh, we have a cancer and therapeutic module that we each get um, kind of like, we each, each group follows a patient and then we look at different treatments throughout each session. And uh, it's like, we're looking at the patient and then getting doing the test, getting more information. And different groups would look at different treatments that we would say propose or based on our own findings, which treatment would we and like we do we think works for the patient and guided by our tutors, we go through those in depth based on what we learn from our lectures. Um, during lectures, we also get to look at different case studies. So in our class, depending on your lecturer, sometimes they will go through case studies as well. Uh, what do you think, Dr. McGovern? Yeah, I think, I mean, there'll, there'll be different examples, won't there? So yeah. you're right. So in year two, for example, you, you follow patients with a cancer diagnosis and you learn a bit more about them each week. Um, some of the small group teaching you may have certain scenarios so so yeah. um so it's it's an important way of teaching because it, it makes it real you know you actually think this this is sort of you know what happens um so so depending on the module you might get quite yeah. a lot of case-based teaching so that's something that you're interested in um um, yeah, there's a question here about give, giving a brief day in your life as a cancer biomedical biomedicine student do you want to Tell us, talk through a normal day for you. What what's what's your your normal day as a student? So usually, like on typical days, I'll go for lectures. Uh, we don't get very long hours of lecture a day. Usually, it will be like two to three hours per section, and so I would have a, quite a lot of free time to do my own stuff outside of school. So usually I would, you know, I love grocery shopping. <laughs> so after class, I usually go to like the grocery stores around campus and then I will think of what to eat for that day. And when I get back, I'll take a look at my reading materials. I'll cook something. So that's, that's like a typical day. Some days I would go into the main campus for some society events. So there's a lot of societies and clubs you can join at UCL so I'm pretty sure you will find something that suits your interest so it's always fun to go to those because you can meet people outside of your course and to just um, kind of take a break as well um, when I get more work like assignments or when I 
my exam day is nearing, I will go to the student center to study because I feel like, oh, I focus better when I see everyone else is working hard around me. It's like pressuring me to, okay, you also got to focus now. So I would go there, but it's all, it's pretty crowded sometimes. So you can go onto the UCL website and to book a slot. So it's also good for me because it makes me committed to actually go in and to not just wake up the next day and be like, oh, I'm just not going to go in. Because I'm like, okay, I've booked my slot there. I will go in and um, go through my reading for my afternoon. So it's always nice. There's a lot of different facilities around campus, like libraries. I think there's also like some open museums that shows like anatomy and like different different interesting parts. So it's always nice to hang around campus, meet up with my friends. So that's how my university life is like. <laughs> hey, which answer? Um, hey, another question. As an, as an oncologist, what do you think is the most challenging part of the job? Do you think that research in cancer as a career will be less stressful, or are there other factors to consider when going into the research career? Good, good question. So, yeah. I, think, I, mean, I mean, I mean, I love what I do. I think it's a privilege to be an oncologist, and and working with patients who've got cancer is 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 you know very rewarding. I mean, what's challenging? I mean, you know, the NHS is under a lot of pressure. We're very busy. Um, our new drugs that are coming through are very expensive. So it's trying to, to, to sort of improve things for patients while being able to fund it all. So, so there's a lot of pressure in the NHS. And, you know, we all watch the news. We know how things are at the moment. Um, looking at the second part of the question, do you think research in cancer as a career is less stressful? I'm not sure it's less stressful. I think, you know, research has its own challenges. You know, you need to get grants approved to get funding for your lab. So, so that takes a lot of work. So, so I think it, it's more, you know, if you're really driven and you have a real interest, um, you know, research is, is a very good option. And I certainly have quite a few colleagues who are oncologists and they have a lab as well. So they do both. They have part of their week is working as a, as a clinician and part is, is running a lab as well. So I think both have their challenges. Um, but I think both probably are very rewarding as well in terms of, of enjoyment and, and satisfaction. We have a question on the minimum academic qualifications needed for this course. Are there specific subject or grade requirements? Um, so you can look at, if you look at the prospectus, you'll see what the requirements are. So I think we're currently at three A's for this course, and you do need to have chemistry and biology. Um, we do have contextual offers as well, because, you know, we want to be as inclusive as possible. So don't let that necessarily put you off. So have a look at the prospectus and you'll see um, what the requirements are and, and, and the opportunity for contextual offers as well. Right. Okay. Another question. So someone was reading the book of Emperor of All Melodies, <laughs> and it explores the evolution of cancer treatment from early chemotherapy to targeted therapies. Given UCL's focus on cutting edge research, how are these historical insights shaping current approaches in cancer treatment, particularly in developing more personalized and less invasive therapies? Oh, that's a good question as well, isn't yeah. it? So, so, so the the operable maladies actually we um so we study that at the documentary of that in the cancer medicine in society yeah. module. So um Yanni, you'll remember doing that in, in yeah. year one. So so you know we talk about that being the biography of cancer. So if anyone does want to read anything, it's a pretty good book to read because it tells you how we got to where we are. Um and it probably just looking at that question, you know, it does you know, all, all the theories that went through, you know, we thought, you know, is it is it viruses that are causing cancer? Is it environmental? Is it genetics? You know, all of that has led to the research that we do currently. So, so you know, it's 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 a nice story. It really tells, you know, that how we've got to where we are in terms of cancer treatment and the history as well of 
of, you know, I talked about in my assessing about, you know, we're only been treating, actually being able to treat cancer for about 100 years. Um, and the emperor maladies we'll, we'll talk about, you know, when we first started treatment. So that was, you know, paediatric leukemias in the 1930s and 40s and how we've developed from there. So it's, it's a, good, a good introduction to the story of cancer. Okay. Um, do you have any tips on socializing in uni in general? Yeah, so um, about socializing in uni, as I mentioned, there are a lot of societies and clubs, um, especially when school starts, there's a lot of taster sessions. So even if it's something that you haven't thought of joining, I would say just go for it. So when I was was in year one, I joined like a lot of different taster sessions. So I'm I actually don't like exercising, but I joined like a sailing club taster session, and it was my first time sailing. It was it was really fun. <laughs> so I will say like it's always socializing in uni. If you join different societies and clubs, even if you just show up, like you will definitely meet someone. And also our courses, of course, sometimes we have like socials. So usually that would be in the Cancer Institute and you would get to meet people in your in your current year and in other years as well. So it's always nice to go to those because you can talk to maybe your seniors, talk to your professors, and it's really casual and fun and they always have like snacks and drinks provided. So, uh, so go to those. Um, and we also have transition mentors. So in your year one, you'll be put in a transition group and the your transition mentor would be a year two or year three student. And during those sessions, you can ask questions. And it's also, a, I feel like it's also a nice social gathering because it's like you're meeting your classmates out of class and you just get to get around and to like chat and answer any of your questions really. So. I would say like as an international student, before I was also worried about being lonely coming along here. I was like, oh, I don't know anyone in this school. But when I started my year one, I quickly discovered that that's not an issue given how much support we get here, really. Yeah, so that's that. Okay. Um, throughout the course, is the majority based on lectures or case-based learning? It's probably a mix, isn't it, Yanni? Yeah. So, I mean, we, we do a lot of lectures. Um, we do small group tutorials. Um, the, we've sort of moved away from online teaching. So we've got a person trying to get most of our teaching face-to-face. Um, and then, um, you know, case-based learning when, when appropriate. I'm just looking at the question above that, um, Yanni, just right, again for you, what inspired you to choose cancer biomedicine? Well, I, I was going, I was always studying biology because I, I love learning about like the different processes and like all the cells and how things work. So I was always interested in that bit. And when I was looking through different courses to apply, um, UCL is the only university that offers like a BSc in cancer specifically. So that's when my niche interest in cancer started. So it's like, okay, that sounds really interesting. And I just decided to go for it. And I'm actually, I'm really glad I did because even, well, at, with a such a niche topic, it actually covers a lot. You have, you know, you have like different types of cancer and we even have like modules on cancer impact on society. So it's not just kind of pure science based. You also get to think of like the social impacts and all those different parts. So is I feel like it gives you a really, a really good overview of cancer as a disease and we also get a really good basis of biology because in year one we learn about different physiology parts and different disease so we learn um, all the different systems in our body like the gut system the cardiovascular system so it's i feel like this is great because it gives you a really complete overview and like background to prepare you for 
uh, maybe a career in research. Yeah, so I was, I was, I'm also interested in research. So that's why I was always like looking at like the biology bits. And when I started looking at this degree, I started being interested in cancer specifically. So that's just my story. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Another. Okay. Another question. Dr. So mentioned cutting edge treatments. How does the course address the role of immunotherapy and other emerging treatments in the fight against cancer? And will students explore how these therapies are advancing traditional methods? Yeah, I mean, so so you know, we as Yanni mentioned earlier, so you you do get taught by clinicians. Um, and there are certain modules where, so so clinical cancer would be an example of that, where you'll get a specialist, perhaps, so I treat prostate cancer, so I'll give a lecture on, you know, what's new and current in prostate cancer, so you'll learn about new treatments that are coming through um, and how we're, you know, advancing our traditional treatments, and I mean, immunotherapy is sort of everywhere, to be honest, you know, because it's becoming so relevant in so many cancers so you'll learn about you know there are immune therapy the immune system modules that you do um, and i think immunotherapy is mentioned in many of our cancer modules because it's pivotal to what we're doing so so yeah so you 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 learn about um you know new things and you know we, we will update our lectures every year because something new is happening on the scene you know there's a new treatment for colorectal cancer well then you're going to get a clinician who's going to tell you about that so you do you do keep learning about uh, uh, new techniques and new new treatments that are coming through Thanks. Okay, another question. Are there scholarships available spe specifically for students pursuing research or a career in oncology, particularly in areas like immunotherapy or precision medicine? Additionally, are there grants or funding options to support student-led research projects during the course? Hmm. I think, I mean, we do have students who apply for scholarships. Um, they're not maybe specific from UCL or within the Cancer Institute. So um, many different countries offer scholarships to their students or there are research institutes, international research institutes that you can apply for. So it's competitive. Um, and, you know, but certainly I know some of our students have been successful. I mean, Yanni, you probably will know as well that um, there's opportunities out there for some funding uh, yeah, but for like research projects, when I'm thinking of like PhD funded research projects, so that's not at our stage currently. Mm. Yeah, not at a BSc level. Um, I'm not sure about scholarships available in the UK, but internationally, like I don't get a lot of scholarships to go study in UK, because. It's only uh, yeah yeah it's really competitive yeah, yeah. there are some um, certainly we have um within ucl for for students who do particularly well um there are some prizes and scholarships mm -hmm. of excellence so so if you do really really well in exams and things and and you're you're you know very um involved in your course um we nominate certain students for those scholarships so so there is sort of possibilities there but mm -hmm. you know it's it's um it's competitive, I would say. There's a lot of people looking for these these prizes. So, so um, you know, you need to put in a lot of effort, really. But there are opportunities. Um, and there are also other student-led pro like projects. So last year, I did the Change Makers project. So you basically work with your professors in uh in a specific project that you're proposing. So we did like a alumni mentorship scheme for our BSc program. So those project, when you apply for it, you will you will get a chance to get it funded, right? So it's based it's under the change makers project, but it's not really related to like a research project right now. Yeah, and in year three we do get to work on a research project, so it's in in our curriculum to do that. Yeah. Um. Okay, another question. Does the course discuss ethical issues surrounding cancer research and treatments? 
such as those highlighted in The Immortal Life of Henrietta, uh, Henrietta Lex, and how are these topics integrated into the curriculum to prepare students for real-world ethical dilemmas in oncology? Oh, that's another good question. So, I mean, Yanni, from your perspective, in terms of the modules you do, uh, ethics covered? Yeah. Um, I, I've, and like cancer and society, we do cover like some ethical areas. And we also have um, modules on research ethics. So it's like, oh, the procedure you have to do consents like forms how to apply for it so there are those parts that are covered um, also we do get optional modules so in my year three i'm doing an a model in governing emerging technologies so it's actually not that cancer specific but we look at the dilemma of different technologies so like oh self-driving cars who's responsible or like if we have a new technology how do we govern it how do we distribute um, the risks? How do we distribute responsibility? So we do look at a lot of ethical dilemmas in that course. So it's really interesting because when we look at, like, we look at things like um, genetic engineering. So say so you can say, oh, genetic engineering or like CRISPR, you know, you can, it can be very revolutionary in like, treatments right but also when misused you will think of okay what are the what are the unintended consequences of maybe people abusing this technology so it's interesting to look at the ethical bits so we do cover those in our course and if you're particularly interested you have optional modules that can fit your different areas of interest so yeah that's my experience yeah okay um a couple minutes left so if anyone's yeah. got a burning question oh there's Any another one last question yeah. okay we'll answer this last question what supercurricular activities would you recommend for a year 12 student interested in this field are there specific books courses lab experience or volunteer ex opportunities that will strengthen my understanding and application for this course. Mm, so when I was in year 12, I actually shadowed clinicians, specifically a breast surgeon. So he did like, he was a breast, on, like breast cancer oncologist. So I, that was what I did as an intern experience when I was in year 12. Um, specific books, I think, like, you know, the Emperor of um, Melodies, like, those are good resource to give you a good background on cancer. Mm, I think if the you other have, thing like, I would yeah. to say, yeah. the Cancer Research UK website mm -hmm. is a really good font of knowledge because it talks about you know, global patterns of cancer, um, lots of treatments. There's a, there's a lot of good information there about cancer research. And so um, I often signpost people to that as a website as well. It's it's very interesting. And it really looks at things from a global perspective as well as a UK perspective. So it can be quite interesting. And you'll get a lot of interesting facts and figures from that website. Yeah, so I wouldn't say worry too much about like, you know, getting a lab experience. Just go out and see if you're interested in this subject. Yeah, just whatever to like, just to give you a view of if you're interested in this subject, really. So I think we are running out of time and we'll need to leave it there. However, if you could please provide us with your feedback of how today's session by filling out our survey, which will appear on your browser at the end of this event. It will be greatly appreciated. Thank you for all your comments and questions. And thank you to Dr. Ursula McGovern for an excellent session. Well, Have a great everyone. evening, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.